Have you ever heard that in order to succeed, you need to do what Warren Buffett does, what Bill Gates does, what Mark Cuban does, all the billionaires, they seem to read for four, five, six, seven, eight hours a day. But what about the rest of us who don't have eight hours a day to sit and read? How do they learn? How do high achievers learn? Well, it turns out that high achievers are constantly learning through informal means long after they have finished their formal education and they have gotten all of their degrees and all of the big awards, they are still learning new things. But they're not in the classroom. So how is it that they are learning? We have a great group of people who will tell you how they learn new things and how that has helped them to succeed. So welcome to this week's show of Optimizing Your Success, hosted by The Mentor Project. My name is Dr. Ruth Gotian, and I study extreme high achievers. And knowing how they learn and how they consume new knowledge is one of those four pillars of success. So meet tonight's guests and hear why they are so successful. And then after that, we'll get to how they learn new things. Up first, Janice Lentz. Hi, Ruth, and thanks how for having you? me as, again. Um, <laughs> I am CEO and founder of Hearing Access and Innovations, and my goal is to change the world for people with hearing loss. And what are some of your special projects? One of my projects right now is working on changing the language people in the media use to refer to people with disabilities. Ooh, and what's the way we should be referring? Using person first language, rather than calling someone, calling them like the disabled, uh, as a noun, using it as an adjective and using person first, so a person with a disability rather than the disabled. Can you give an example? So like instead of, uh, in, sometimes you'll see media headlines that say the disabled person did mm -hmm. X. So using it as a noun, it should instead be a person and then maybe somewhere in the article it mentions their disability, but, or, or calling that, or if you wanted to say, um, let's say, Janice has a disability, it would be Janice has a disability versus I am dis I am disabled. So, so it doesn't not define you. The person. Exactly. Got it. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Y. Lee. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show again, uh, Ruth. I am a professor. I also do a fair amount of uh, computational, we build computational analytics, um, AI, computer modeling to help with health and healthcare decision making. I also am a health journalist and I cover health and healthcare for Forbes. And I'm excited about this learning session. Uh, I always like to learn, like for instance, I, I'm i learning very rapidly that a brick wall is probably not a good background, but uh, we'll get back to that later. <laughs> So this is also um, our shows every Monday night are turned into a podcast. So those on the podcast don't know what you're talking about. But Bruce has a fabulous brick wall and he surprises us every week with a new background. And it's sort of what will Bruce have on the show tonight? Well, tonight it is a brick wall, which I think looks fabulous, but he thinks it's not in vogue. But that's I feel all right. like I'm on Sesame Street. A bit. <laughs> hey, that's one of the greatest shows of all time. <laughs> Susie Katz. Hi. Hello. I'm, I'm a photographer and I have an educational nonprofit called Photo Wings, uh, where we utilize photography in ways people, people may not have considered. Um, I, a mentor of mine called it seeing photography with fresh eyes. Oh, I love it. Yeah, we work across disciplines, cultures, and generations. So I'm always trying to think of new ways that people might not have thought about including photography or the ideas or lessons learned from photography. Beautiful. Now you guys can't see for those of you on the podcast, but Susie is always the one who is so perfectly lit because <laughs> as an award-winning photographer, if there's one thing she knows, it's light. And I can't take a picture to save my life, but she always said, follow the light, follow the light. And she does it so well. Thank you, Susie. Last but not least, Devin Harris. Hey, uh, Ruth, thank you so much for uh, inviting me. It's always great to be hanging out with this amazing crew here. Yes, the name is Devon Harris. I'm a uh, a uh, three-time Olympian founding member of the original Jamaican bobsled team. These days, 
I'm a motivational speaker, author, and philanthropist. And I'm excited to to learn some new things. I, you know, I'm learning that Bruce is a pretty funny guy, so hopefully I can. <laughs> So for any of you who have seen the movie Cool Runnings, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you see it. If you haven't seen it, it is loosely based on the story of the Jamaican bobsledders, the first Jamaican bobsledders who competed in the Olympics. And Devin was one of the original members, not in the movie, in actual real life. And it's an incredible story. And I think each time he comes up, we're, we're getting little bits and pieces of that story. We have learned, for example, that he's afraid of heights and speeds. So um, that's pretty interesting for someone who's an Olympic bobsledder. <laughs> um, if you have a screw or two missing, you know, it, it works. <laughs> <laughs> Funny. <laughs> so everyone, this is being converted into a podcast, which comes out every Saturday morning. So go check us out on The Mentor Project. And please leave us a rating and review so other people can watch us. So now you have met this week's extreme high achievers. They are really incredible. And I learn from them each and every week, which is why we've insisted on having this core group that comes every week. And this is great because they are from completely different fields but they're always learning new things, always, constantly. And I can tell you for a fact that high achievers don't learn in the classroom after a certain point in their lives. So I am curious, Janice, how is it that you learn new things? Because your field in particular, you had to teach yourself. So how is it that you learned new things? Well, pre-pandemic, two different ways there's pre-pandemic and now and now but pre-pandemic i like to go to lectures um at various places hearing really I impressive people speak and it doesn't really matter about the topic so i remember once going to john hopkins university in baltimore and i live in new york um, to attend a conference on sex trafficking because advocates are advocates and it doesn't matter what they're advocating for, it's about um, skill sets. And mm. so I will go to all sorts of different topics. I went to um, a lecture on credit card monopolies where Senator Warren was speaking so I could speak to Senator Warren about breaking the hearing aid monopoly. So I find lectures really unbelievable. It's much harder now because on these webinars, you don't have the same type of access that you do when you're in person where you can arrive early. Here, you you have to be led into a room, you know, on Zoom calls, it's not quite as effective. But the one play, way I am trying to learn is listening to podcasts. And we have a mutual friend, um, Andy Lapata, who's been on this segment and his uh, podcast, The Connected Leadership is excellent. So I listen to podcasts when I'm making my bed, you know, cleaning the house or doing, you know, all those really boring things. I'm listening to The Connected Leadership. Oh, I love it. Shout out to Andy. Absolutely. He is also another mentor on The Mentor Project. And you're right. He has been a guest on this show before. So you're bringing up a great point is that there are other ways to learn. And one is by listening, which seems to be the way that you do it most by listening to lectures and by listening to podcasts. But you also did something which is very interesting, which is another thing that high achievers do is that they make connections. So while going to a lecture on sex trafficking may not be apparent at how that's related to your field of creating hearing access, you made the connection that advocates are advocates and you're advocating to sometimes the same people using the same skill set. So I don't know if you picked that up from the work that you did or you always knew that to make those connections? I couldn't find, um, in the disability world, um, people in the disability world tend to do the same thing over and over again. And to me, if it's not successful, why keep repeating it? Mm, so yeah. I didn't really understand, uh, it hadn't been successful. So I couldn't find innovative leaders in the disability field. And so I had to, I figured it was like when CEOs are friends with CEOs, they don't are friends with CEOs at different companies, I would take the same approach. So I had to find top advocates in 
lots of different fields. And I decided it was the only way I was going to try and find new innovative techniques. And so a lot of my program of what I've done has been from top advocates in different fields like climate change. I sought out um, Jeffrey Sachs of the Earth Institute who helped me create a best practice model. So I regularly seek out, I just need smart people. It doesn't really matter what the topic is. I can for, first off connect disabilities to anything because people with disabilities do everything. So there's always an angle, but I just need smart people who have creative thinking. And, and it, if I just talk to them, I can learn. And it doesn't even matter who they are. They don't even have to be CEOs. As I've mentioned, I learned from taxi drivers. I just want smart people who That's, are can do, proactive can do people. I love that. You wanna share the um, what Jeffrey Sachs, the model that he shared with you, because you, you said it to me once and I thought it was so brilliant. And it's so interesting. It's someone from a completely different field than you who basically in five minutes knew exactly how you should structure your approach. Are you willing to share with everyone the model? Oh, the sure. Three, the three tier model that you told he, me about? I mean, he's Jeffrey Sachs from the Earth Institute because he's Jeffrey Sachs. I mean, he's just seriously brilliant. But he was speaking at my son's school. And I, so he was a change maker. So I asked him what he thought I could do. And literally in seconds, he said, well, you live in New York City. Why not make New York City your best practice model? And then once you do a really good job in New York City, then because every place has name brand recognition, right? It, no matter where you are in the United States, if you say, oh, I worked with the Met or I worked with Lincoln Center, people in the music or art field will know what the Met and Lincoln Center is. And he said, and then you can use that as a best practice model across the country. So work on like the American Museum of Natural History, work the Met, um, Lincoln Center, well, you know, the, the premier places in New York City, and which made total sense. And I had already sort of been doing that, working on brand name things, but he, he kind of broke what I was doing in a cohesive way together. I think I was doing it naturally, but not with the same game plan. And once he kind of corralled the whole idea together, it made total sense. And then that's I what I did. I only worked on name brand places and then used each place that I worked with to leverage across the country. And Love it was it. really easy to do because people just knew the various names across the country. And then it snowballed. Yes. And then it snowballed. And it's very easy when you call up a museum in another state and you said, I did this in New York City. First off, it's um name rec it's name recognizable but it's also people ha have respect for it because if you were able to break through institutions like that then they have respect for you but again there was a climate change lecture fascinating i just need smart pe i just need information from smart people so that's the thing is that high achievers will learn from anyone does it matter if the person senior to them junior to them at their level different industry it's really just about consuming knowledge which is what you were saying that you were doing by listening to people listening to podcasts talking to other people it's that same thing it's about consuming new knowledge thanks janice mm -hmm. devin yeah this i mean this this topic was made for you was it right yeah. It was made for you because um, you were an officer in the military in Jamaica. This, uh, you were a middle distance runner, not a sprinter, which is what I would think bobsledders need to mm -hmm. get off the starting line. You'd never seen a bobsled before. Um, so how is it that you learned how to be a world-class Olympic bobsledder? Well, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me go back a little bit to, to high school and, uh, you know. Oh, that's way back. Yeah, well, yeah. That's a little. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned I was a military officer. And so when I was in high school, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I never wanted to see another book after high school, right? Because I thought I was going to be running around, you know, firing guns and all that stuff. And I joined the army. And yes, I was running around firing guns and all that stuff. But I, they gave me a big stack of books to read as well. I'm like, I got tricked. Um, but it dawned on me that, wow, you know, if you are to, uh, if you want to accomplish something, there's uh, some learning that you have to do along yeah. the way. And when I speak to kids uh, in school now, I, I talk to them about the fact that what they're 
really doing is learning how to learn. Yeah. And while I wasn't thinking about this in school, I realized that you know all the homework, all the projects that uh, we got in school, I'm, I'm applying those strategies and tactics. And uh, in all the things that I've done since, right, whether it's bobsledding or you know I've written two books that I've self-published. Um, and so what the, the idea is, are the whole the way I approach it first is to listen. I remember when I started Bob studying, and I'm hearing all these conversations about uh, sponsorship and marketing, and it. I mean, those conversations were so alien to me. It was like Russian or Chinese, you know. So I would just sit there and and with my eyes and ears wide open and my mouth too. Huh? What are they talking about? You know. But after a while, the the, the you just kind of start to. I guess, get some of that information through osmosis and it starts to make sense a little bit. Um, but as you you keep listening and you keep talking to people um, and you keep uh, trying uh, some of the concepts that you're, that you're being exposed to now, uh, you start to learn. Learning takes, uh, takes, uh, takes shape, I would say. And you go, wow, well, you know, so you, so you learn, the thing is that, our lives are not disjointed. Everything is interconnected. So once you've learned how to master a particular skill in one area, that um, mindset, actually, you can apply to another area. So, you know, I learned how to be a soldier and I learned how to be a middle distance runner uh, by reading books on running, uh, you know, books out of the US. I remember seeing the term NCAA and I, and I didn't even know what that meant, but that was, that was peripheral to the conversation about how you run an 800 meter race, you know? Um, so yeah, you, you read and you listen and you talk to people and, and try to absorb the, 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 the information and then apply it, most important, apply it. Uh, so Devin, you could read all the books you want on running the 800 meter that doesn't teach you how to effectively get out of the starting blocks. So how is it that you took that information and learned how to apply it and how to finesse it and how to correct it and how to perfect it? And how did you do that with your Olympic sport? Yeah, well, um, so as I said, you, you read, but you have to do, right? So that's that's the key. It's not just to, you know, they, they say knowledge is power. Well, you know, you could argue that knowledge is uh, trivial. And so you have to take the knowledge and apply it. That's where the power comes in. Um, and so they, when I think about making that transition from say running an 800 meter race, which is much slower to the explosive start that you have in bobsledding, really was the mindset of me, that, that young kid who was willing to do all that running, all that work to become a top 800 meter runner. You go, okay, I've done that work before. So now I can do this work of, you know, I was only running 30 meters. No, that, that, that's easier. Um, no, but so you had the work ethic. Yeah, it's a, it's, you know, you have a work ethic and you, you, you have that mindset that if I've done this work over here, then I can do a similar work over here as well. I love it. So it sounds to me like you are what's called an experiential learning, experiential learner. You actually mm -hmm. learn by doing. Yeah, is I, that I would agree. Um, you know, obviously there are some steps, you know, other steps that I think come before that. Uh, listening, as I talk yes. about sitting at the table and hearing these conversations and, uh, you know, having a hard time really understanding. But then once you have heard this over, you're like, okay, let me go try. Because you're absolutely right. The only way you can say you know it or you've learned it is by demonstrating that you can do it. Um, so yeah, I, I learned that the only way to learn how to push a bobsled is to do it. Which, as you know, for those who who have heard Devin on this show before, he had to learn that really, really fast. It was a real time crunch for him to learn that. And keep listening because he'll give us sneak peeks into what that whole story was like. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Devin. Bruce, from behind or in front of the brick wall. You went to medical school. You then went to graduate business school. That is a lot of sitting and reading and memorizing and regurgitating. And then you had a residency, which is more 
reading and more of that experiential learning and more of those standardized tests. But eventually you finish your training and you had, you had an extra long training. So how do, is it that you keep learning new things, keep staying on top of what you're doing? I mean, what you're doing now is not what you went to medical school for originally. How are you learning new things? Yes, fortunately, I didn't go to classes often, so I, I <laughs> saved that uh, sitting time. Uh, I, don't, sitting I don't know that we want to share that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so, you know, I think one of the things that I've seen is um, sometimes people will, will decide in advance whether something's worth listening to or learning and then sort of say, okay, not important. They'll classify as not important. And then they'll close their ears and sort of close their minds and, and not pick something up. But I've, I've learned that you never really know when something will be useful um, down the road. And it doesn't have to be useful. I mean, you, you can learn for the sake of learning. And that keeps your mind open. So, for instance, uh, recently I learned from uh, two very esteemed astrophysicists that the, um, that the universe is expanding. And, um, you know, then I subsequently asked, you know, okay, well, will that affect practical things? Like, for instance, if there's a piece of avocado, Avocado toast in front of me. Will it get further from me because everything's expanding? And they assured me, no, that's that's not going to be a problem. Your so, avocado toast is safe. Exactly. So I could easily have said, okay, well, there's no quote unquote practical value in learning that the universe is expanding uh, from like a day to day standpoint, like immediately. But it's, it was fascinating because this is key. Inf this is important information, and and I got an opportunity to learn from you know super high level astrophysicists about this information. And I was just curious. And so you just never know when those things will become useful. You, I think you just have to have a habit of, of being open to many different things. Um, and as you like travel, like I've, I've crossed different fields. So you realize that things actually cross fields. There's a lot of cross learning. So, you know, I, I've learned a lot from, for instance, uh, Susie and her photography and her photographic knowledge. Like she, she was describing to me, you know, er earlier this year about how, you know, a photographer, not, you know, it's not just taking a picture. You have to kind of frame the picture. You have to understand the story. You have to capture that, that kind of stuff applies to everything and really being observant and understanding people and understanding uh, things. But if I were someone who just said, okay, I'm just a filing system say, okay, photography. Okay. I'm not going to take a picture tomorrow. So I shouldn't, don't need to learn this. And I'm, I'm just going to toss it away. Um, and I think kind of being very open to different possibilities is important because then I found like so many crossovers with fields. Like I learned something from one field and it can actually apply to another field. So your case is really interesting, especially because of your medical background from going to med school and going to business school, but you're also a journalist and you're a computational scientist. I mean, those things don't exactly go hand in hand. And they're very different, right? So mm -hmm. you can't just learn new things and figure out where to file it in your brain because we don't always know where to file it, but that's a whole separate discussion. Mm -hmm. um, that's actually called the banking system of learning where somebody makes a deposit, but nobody tells you which account it goes in, in your mm -hmm. brain. Yes. Um, but you learn, you, you're working in these four disparate fields. How is it that you learn how to do those because a lot of that stuff I would think you had to teach yourself. Yeah, I guess I mean if, if uh, speaking of accounts, I guess my 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 mind is just sort of like this large uh, nondescript checking account and savings account. I guess by that definition, it, it I um I remember so I worked in the business world for a little while, and I got a lot of questions. They're like, oh, what is a doctor doing in the business world? Um, and then I remember when I would segue to the medical world, they're like, what is a business person doing? Um, the medical yeah. field. And then so I got that, I've gotten that constantly. What is a blank doing in a blank? And um, so I got used to it. At, at the beginning, I was like, hmm, yeah, what am I doing here? But then I um, sort of, uh, you know, it, it's sort of like the uh, the plot of Mean Girls, where at the beginning you care about the different, you know, cliques that you're in. And at some point you just give up because you don't really fall into any clique. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I got that frequently early on and then, uh, yeah, I was wondering, okay, what, how is this applicable? But then eventually you start seeing that there are these common themes. So like in business, you learn a lot about, you know, the flow of, of, um, 
finances and you learn about management and, and those things apply every field. Um, or like in medicine, you learn to listen to patients, uh, you hear about their stories, you run into many different people, that applies to writing, uh, that applies to management. So they all apply to like each other, like it's one big uh, gigantic, um, you know, connected thing. Uh, and like I said, you know, you shouldn't look at yourself like say, okay, so say you're like a hot dog baker. You shouldn't just say that the <laughs> only thing that matters are hot dogs. And if I, if it doesn't involve hot dogs, I'm not going to listen to it. But you have to realize that you know you have you know you need to know finance, you need to know marketing, you need to know many different things. So like, not sticking to like a specific um, hot dog or something like that is key. I how how did, how did hot dogs come into the conversation again, Bruce? It was just it was just some inspiration. It just you, appeared in my head. You know, every time we have we have this deal, Bruce and I, that every time he brings up hot dogs, I'm gonna say tiara. And I have a tiara that Kelly Korak, who's been on the show before, got me over there. I'm, I'm tempted to put it on. So people who are watching the show saw me turn around because I, I often give book recommendations. And I just talked about the banking theory which is usually what you see in formal education where there is um, somebody standing at the lectern and professing and throwing knowledge at you, but not telling you how to organize that knowledge in your brain. So I mentioned that's called the banking system where the knowledge is deposited, but nobody tells you which account in your brain to put it in, how to file it. So for those who are interested in learning more about that, people know I am an avid reader. I read 70 to 100 books a year, so I always love giving book recommendations. And that idea of the banking system is actually from this book called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire, who's a Brazilian theorist. Again, it's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, you're gonna either love or hate the book. People go on, on both sides of the spectrum, but there's a lot of useful stuff in here with one of them being that um, banking system. Thank you, Bruce. So I think what you said is a perfect segue to Susie because one of the things that I know that they teach in medical school now, at least they were doing it pre-pandemic, is they would often take medical students to museums to look at artwork and look at photographs and look at things beyond what is right there on the canvas. And I think that's a perfect segue to Susie, our world-class photographer. How did you learn how to do this? And how do you learn new things? I mean, the technology and what you do changes every 15 minutes. How is it that you learn? Well, I think I was born with a, with a photographic eye. I could put anything into a rectangle but I have an insatiable curiosity. And when I was young, I, people said that I was profoundly influenced by show and tell. Mm -hmm. So I love to observe things and share my ideas. But I'm a believer that you can learn any, you can learn from everybody, no matter what it is. And you, and you never know when in life you're gonna be able to apply that. Yeah. Whether it's a positive lesson or a negative lesson or how somebody has lived their life in a way that you may not want to do or a way that interests you. They say, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. So I have an insatiable curiosity and I spend a lot of my time around people not in photography so that I can learn more about what they do and that knowledge always comes in helpful in some capacity, whether I'm photographing, it gives me someone something to talk about with somebody or just a, a life lesson in general. Um, when it's interesting that you talk about uh, medical students going to an art gallery because one of our grantees, uh, our, our flash grant winners, has a has a grant has a grant out now, or we're she's putting together a toolkit on how doctors can become more observant, and that it that lesson comes in every which way. For example, with the lighting. For example, you can learn from the great art how somebody can look better you can look you can use it to know if you're on a zoom call how somebody can look heavy or thin um you could there's uh if you're walking down a street you can look at a leaf and if you look from underneath you can see how it's made better it'll give you a better sense of color 
So if you're a doctor, you can look at somebody's skin tone or maybe their body language and how they carry themselves. And I like to say uh, that in photography, you can, you can use those skills if you're going to a party to meet a future spouse or a job interview to learn more about the person who's interviewing you and uh, learn more about them. And it'll give you conversation starters in ways that you may never have thought of. You never know where that knowledge is going to come in useful. And photography, it's everything. If you're going to really be a good photographer and know how to tell a good story. So it's about telling a story. Mm -hmm. That one, It's the picture's worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Love it. Love it. Um, so Janice, I know that you do some of this uh, work as well. You want to come off mute? There you go. Um, so we were just uh, talking a little bit in the chat. Do you want to tell us about the study that you often reference? Um, well, there's a study from the Guggenheim Museum about um, art teaching critical thinking. And it because it's, for me, I use the study because it's why museums should, why going to a museum is so critical for people with hearing loss. When people or stu students go to a museum and they don't have access, they don't get that critical thinking, um, which is, cr you know, forcing your brain to look at a, a piece of art and then understanding why that piece of art, what do you see in the art, it, it forces you to think. And it's, um, especially modern art, forces you to think much harder than if you're looking like a piece of fruit. Although, as Susie points out, the lighting of that fruit is probably pretty critical. So there you go. I hadn't even thought about that, but it, it's the study that um, I posted in our private chat that I'm sure you can easily, you, you know, you can post. It's a great study to explain about critical thinking and why that's so important. Um, so I use, I reference that study all the time. But I learn from every place, you know, it, it's interesting, you read a lot of books. My thing is, I love watching movies, but I'm that person in a movie theater who's taking notes. So I have watched like the LBJ movie um, that was referencing and like, I never really focused uh, before that movie about you had the Civil Rights Act and then you needed the Voters' Right Act to augment it. And I, even though I'd read about that, I don't know why it just never understood I never connected it quite as much when I watched the LBJ movie. And so I'm sitting and taking notes. I'm like that really annoying person. I own it. <laughs> taking notes on my, my phone during the movie. And like, or if, especially if they're pithy statements, I'm writing notes. And I will then file those notes by movie. Even when I'm watching movies on Netflix, I'm like taking notes all the time. Because they're really sometimes really great Sometimes I just need a sound bite or to reference it. So I'm I'm less of a reader because by the time I'm done doing my work, my brain's wiped. So I'm watching movies. I get lots of great stuff from the, watching the, I'm watching Suits right now. You get great lines from that show. That's, and then a, that's I a great show. <laughs> yeah, I work it in. Like I can learn from anything. Well, see the thing is, and, and this is how I, I kicked off the show. It's not about reading. That's not what makes them high achievers. It's the fact that they are constantly consuming new knowledge. And there's so many ways that you can consume new knowledge. And I think everyone's heard just a few of those ways. You can read, you can listen to podcasts, you can watch YouTube, you can watch movies, you can read articles, you can talk to people, you can actually do it at the experiential learning. There's so many ways that you can consume new knowledge. So don't think that you just need to be reading for four, five, six, seven, eight hours a day. The issue is you're constantly working your brain, constantly being curious, constantly wanting to learn new things. And you'll learn it from anyone. As I said at the top of the hour, you will learn it from anyone who has information that you don't yet know. So it can be someone who's senior to you but it could be a peer, it could be someone junior to you, it could be one of those internet friends. I mean, it really can be anyone, anywhere, at any time. The point is that you have to constantly consume new knowledge and constantly learn new things as opposed to just sitting there and not not doing anything, right? If you were to play, I don't know, Candy Crush all day, I don't know that you're constantly consuming new knowledge. 
I don't play Candy Crush. I could be wrong. Correct me if I am. Um, but you really want to just constantly um, work your brain to constantly learn new things. And then as Susie said, you never know when you can pull that out and mm -hmm. actually make those connections as Janice was making those connections as well. So something to think about. Anyone else wanna chime in there or anyone who's watching live, if you have questions mm -hmm. for any of the panelists, you could just type it in and hopefully Jack's behind mm -hmm. the scenes can let us know what those questions are. Bruce, go ahead. I have learned from Candy Crush. What I learned is I shouldn't have been playing Candy Crush. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's always a good idea to try to think out of the box. For example, when I'm going to a conference, I try to go a lot of different kinds of conferences. And I always try to go to something that I may not have thought I was interested in. And the other thing I do is I don't always watch the speaker. I'll look around and see who's particularly interested. And that might be somebody that I might want to get to know better. Uh, you can... And when if I'm watching television, um, like I like to watch the night, sh the evening shows, and I like to put it on pause just before the person is actually thinks that they're on camera. There's a split second where you can see that they may be really nervous, and I'll freeze frame and I'll take a picture of that freeze frame and I keep them. And it reminds me that even the most famous people are nervous or insecure. And it helps me have confidence that I'm not the only one that gets nervous. So try to think of ways that are not the normal way that you would think about things. Absolutely. And you know, one of those things, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, Susie. We talked a few episodes about, a few episodes ago about networking. And um, one of the ways that I recommend to people is how they can connect with others is, yes, the speaker is fabulous, but getting through to the speaker might be very challenging if there's many other people in the room and there's usually a long line. To get to the speaker, then the speaker has to leave. But the other people in the room came there for a reason. And they came because they're interested. And asking a question, you really put your vulnerability out there. Because you know there's always the same three to five people who ask all the questions because they like the sound of their own voice. Oh, no. <laughs> You've never experienced that? <laughs> it's always the same three to five people. But for the rest of the people who ask a question, I always suggest following up with the person and say, I really appreciated your question or I really appreciated your comment about X because, and let them know why it resonated with you. And that will help you make a connection with the person. And this can also be done on virtual events as well. If somebody makes a comment or asks a question in the chat, you can follow up with them and let them know why you really appreciated that. And you can connect with everyone on social media now. So it's, it's not so <laughs> challenging if you give it about 45 seconds. So thank you. Go ahead, I you know, I, 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 I like to read, um, and I, I like Janice, I like to watch movies as well. And I, and I love a great, you know, inspirational line, but I learned something now. You, you can actually take notes, watch yeah. movies. And I don't know why I never thought of that before. Um, but you know, as you're, what I, I was listening to you earlier, Ruth, and I was thinking, oh, neuroplasticity, because as we are learning and taking in new information, our brains are adapting and uh, you know, kind of stretching and figuring out a, a new way of being and hence a new way of us becoming, uh, or, or us allowing us to become more of that person that we wish to, to become, right? So the, the new knowledge, the new learning is not just for trivia, um, but for you know, obviously personal growth. That's really what successful people are about. Absolutely. And you had to reinvent yourself several times, Devin. I mean, so, so you, nice. I never thought of it that way, but um, but you're, you're right. I mean, it you, you know, developing this ability to learn, you know, um, I think gives you a certain level of confidence that goes, there is this new thing that I need to go do. And, you, you know, again, you have a mindset of, I've done it before in this field, I can go do it again in this field. Um, and so it, it really just gives you that mindset, that confidence uh, that makes you know that you can go succeed in whatever it is that you want to do. See, I think the, the reason is, and then Janice, I know you were going to say a comment. 
when you say you're always out to learn something new, that is really telling yourself and telling the world, I do not know everything. There's more for me to learn. And I think by saying that, by doing that, you're really opening yourself up to acquiring new knowledge as opposed to saying, I know everything I need to know. Because if you're that kind of person, you know everything you need to know, your bar is pretty low. You'll never get ahead. You'll never get ahead because you already told yourself and everyone else that you already have mastered whatever it is. But if you look at high achievers, they have never mastered. There's always something new they can learn. They're still working at it. They are constantly still working and still fine tuning what it is that they need to do always. <laughs> And in this yeah. new world, in this new world, nobody knows what the jobs of tomorrow are going to be. Exactly. So the more you learn how to think and to be able to think ahead as to what's coming, then you can be part of the future as opposed to stuck in the past with no job. Absolutely. And what I tell people is 10 years ago, I, I, I mean, did we have, was social media such a thing? I mean, now, you know, there might have been someone who did it for, you know, an hour out of the month, right? Now we have entire teams that do this in every organization who are just in charge of social media. There's majors in college for social media. That didn't exist 10 years ago, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it exists now. Janice, I want to hear what you were going to say. Um, I'm the thing about asking a question to a panel. I like, and I regularly ask a question, but not to hear myself speak. Um, that, and there's a difference. And I always tell people, um, actually this comes up during podcasts. If you ask a meaningful and thoughtful question, it's really an effective advocacy tool because everybody in the room is probably there for because they're interested in whatever who the speakers are. So you have a great focus group in a sense of people in your field or similar fields, whatever the reason. And when you stand up and you identify who you are, you've now just told an entire room who you are. You, when you ask a thoughtful, not a question to hear yourself speak question, you have now just identified yourself as somebody who asks good questions. And I have been able to really um, get a lot of work done by doing that. And so one of the examples I can think of is at um, President Obama's WLF, I can't remember what it stands for, something leadership forum or something like that. I asked a question to Secretary Sebelius about hearing aids and, and why they were included in essential health benefits. And someone heard me speak and then approached me um, and they asked if I wanted to be represented to um, affect change, right? now. There is no way I would have known this person had that opportunity. And, and for a long time, they represented me. It was Aiken Gump, um, a major lobby law firm in Washington, represented me until they had a client who said they couldn't um, work on hearing aids anymore. That's, but for, for a long time, we were making really great headway on that. And that was a golden opportunity. But I've had that similar type of situations over and over happen. So I always try to come up with a really good question because it's a great way people will come up to me afterwards who are interested in my topic and identify themselves. So I, I'd like to bring it around that, yes, you should absolutely ask very thoughtful questions. But I also want to add that if you hear someone else who made a thoughtful question that you follow up with them afterwards, because that is when magic happens. And that's exactly what happened to Janice. Somebody heard her question and they had the, the, um, the guts to get up and talk to her more about it, to get more information. There was a match made and the rest is history. So really it goes hand in hand, I think. I am getting a lot of flack here for um, saying that the video games are not helpful. And everyone is now telling me about all the wonderful things you can do if you play with a joystick. So everything from photography to gastroenterology. So uh, I apologize <laughs> <laughs> if that wasn't helpful. The point is get your brain activated and moving. Guys, we need to wrap this up. I am in New York. We have a lot of snow falling. 
And there are some people who are still shoveling outside. Susie's in California. She has no idea what I'm talking about. We uh, in New York, we're getting storm. 16 to 20 inches. Yeah, uh, we, we have a big so. storm out, out now. It's very windy. <laughs> Can you beat our 16 to 20 inches of snow? <laughs> well, you, you have our storm from last week where we had 53 mile an hour wind. So wow. It's wow. The, the storm that keeps on giving. <laughs> I guess, I guess. So everybody, let us know. I'm going to call on each of you where people can hear more about you. And for those who are listening, I want you, please, if you hear us on the podcast, let us know. Leave us a rating and review so other people can find us. We're getting great feedback. Everybody here, all of these high achievers are donating their time each and every week to share their best practices. So all we ask in return is that you leave us a rating and review and let us know what you'd like to hear. It might be a topic that comes up in a future show or might be something that Bruce or I write about in Forbes, you never know. <laughs> so Susie, where can people learn more about you? Well, I spend most of my time these days working on my nonprofit Photo Wings, P H O T O W I N G S dot org. And uh, you can learn a little bit more about what we do also and on the Mentor Project website, One Hour with a Mentor. I gave a presentation there. And uh, you can see a little bit of my personal photography on at SusanCatsPhotography.com. But I included those pictures in the One Hour with a Mentor. So you can see them there. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And thanks for coming. And please check out her pictures. You will never, ever look at photos again the same way. So it, it's, it's, it's mind blowing. It's absolutely mind blowing. That's the best way that I can describe it. I'm not usually one who's stunned into silence. I was definitely stunned into silence when I saw those pictures. <laughs> Thank you. Janice, where can people find more, out more about you? Well, my consulting work, they can find me at hearingaccess.com. And for my advocacy work, they can find me at janicelintz.com. Thank you. Our <laughs> favorite Jamaican bobsledder, Devin Harris, where can people learn more about you? I know you have the same snow I do. We live not far from each other. So, <laughs> Devin, you're muted. You're muted, Devin. You're still muted. Yep. There we go. The only way to keep me quiet is to mute me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about learning and the fact that we're living in a world that's constantly changing. One of the quotes, one of my favorite quotes on this is from Eric Hoffer, who says, in times of change, learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Mm -hmm. And I think really successful people you know, are learners, and so they, they find themselves being able to cope and thrive uh, with, with in changing times. So you can find me at devonharris.com. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my uh, Twitter and IG handle are keep on pushing 88. Uh, uh, feel free to check out my uh, podcast at uh, youtube.com slash keep on pushing always. I'm on Facebook. I'm the guy in the Jamaican bobsled uniform. So I'm everywhere. And Devin and I had a fun show together last week, which you can check out both on his LinkedIn page and mine. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, we that really was a lot of fun. Talk. Thank you for, for joining me. Thank you for having mm -hmm. me. We got to talk about mentorship. So I was excited because I'm usually the one who interviews the Olympic athletes, but now I was being interviewed by one. The so the tables have turned. turned. <laughs> No, it, it was a conversation. It wasn't an interview, was it? It was fun. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bruce Wiley. Uh, yes, you can find me in front of this brick wall uh, where I am most of the week. So I actually, um, if you Google Bruce Wiley, um, uh, the key is the Y, because if you Google Bruce Lee, you'll get something completely different. Uh, I'm also at BruceWiley.com, and my Twitter handle is Bruce underscore Y underscore Lee. Uh, and I also, if you also uh, Google Bruce Wiley Forbes, you'll see some of my writing. Um, and I forgot to mention one way I learn a lot, which is I watch the Optimize Your Success show each and every week. <laughs> Good one, Bruce. Good I'm one. I'm learning because 
I, I have to say, you know, the, the, uh, the, the hello folks on this uh, panel and, and you, Ruth, I, I learned so much from all of you. So uh, that's a great way to learn. <laughs> I love it. My name is Dr. Ruth Gotian. I can be found on my website, ruthgotian.com. All of the social media, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter is just my name, Ruth Gotian. You can also find on Forbes, I have new articles coming out every Tuesday morning. Tomorrow, I am covering Dr. Adam Grant from Wharton, his new book, Think Again, which is fantastic. So check it out. Check us out again next week. We will see you all then. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Mentor Project who's hosting us. And Jax who's behind the scenes making us look all gorgeous. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.